Hey, this is Mark here, and we're um, concluding, I think, <laughs> a series on residual energy and haunts. And we're going to do that by uh, bringing the series to a conclusion by analyzing certain objections to my views and or people's evidence given for residual energy. You know, it's the absoluteness of the laws of thermodynamics that have given me the cognitive rest or confidence that uh, residual energy simply uh, cannot be true. You know, if you Google residual energy, then you will find various groups or people ex explaining it. But if you look closely, they're assuming it's true and then giving examples of it, or they give examples of it and then uh, say that it's residual energy, but they don't give what I would call uh, scientific evidence. Um, what you will not find on Google is anyone really critiquing it. And that's one reason why I'm so passionate about this issue, because nobody else seems to be speaking out against it. And that's certainly not my main reason for speaking about it, but it's, it's one. So let's look at some of the uh, theories that people have put forth in reply. And I think that'd be a, a suiting way, suitable way of bringing this to a conclusion. The first argument that I have heard is, uh, actually it's a pretty common one. Um, you ever heard someone say that uh, when you walked into a room, after a couple had just had an argument, um, and you didn't know it, but if you walked in the room, you could just feel the the negative energy, which uh, this particular person referred to as residual energy. And the, they said that this energy from the argument could last for a long time. And like I said, I've heard this kind of reasoning a lot recently, but is it true? In light of thermodynamics, it cannot be true. Um, energy from a, an argument, just whatever energy is involved, if there is any energy, um, it must dissipate. Energy of any kind must dissipate. Uh, now, this was offered as evidence of residual energy, but it's really not evidence at all. It's an anecdote. It's an experience which was interpreted by this man uh, in a certain way. Uh, the fact is that if you walked into this room, you probably would have noticed uh, unconsciously certain body language and other subtle or perhaps not so subtle clues that things were not in sync so to speak um, and what this man did is that he read into his experience his beliefs and perhaps overlooked the times when he was in a similar situation did not did not feel uh, a thing. See, at 62 years old, I've never walked into a room and felt negative energy, and unless um, it was there was a presence of the demonic, and they were walked into a room where there was an argument, and that there was just like negativity hanging in the air. If the only thing that was negative was just the way people were looking at each other or posturing and, and so forth. And so many different ways that uh, clues people can give off by the way they're acting. So 30 years ago, I don't think anyone would have even spoken like this as far as explaining um, what happens when people argue. That's just an example of how the pagan worldview has really crept into our thinking in such subtle ways and our language. Okay, the second example that the same person gave for residual energy was that high EMF readings can cause people to have physical symptoms or problems. And I agree, sure. Uh, exposure to high electrical presence can be detrimental to one's health. But 
what does that have to do with residual energy? Because that is based on live energy source in a home, not a residual source. Now, uh, moving on from there, I'm going to quote from a friend of mine who is a paranormal investigator. I won't mention his name. This is from a blog in which he refers to my argument. And uh, it's going to be a, a, kind of a lengthy quote, but here we go. Um, Hunneman's scientific perspective is sound, and he buttresses his perspective with the reality of demonic deception. Deception is one of Satan's greatest weapons in his arsenal, preventing us to know the truth. It is true that both Satan and demons alike thrive on their ignorance to their existence and their work. Demons can reenact past events that have taken place at a property. He is correct in believing that the demonic can conceal themselves in residual hauntings blinding us to the true nature of uh, the haunting. Following his line of thought, we see the folly of paranormal groups assuring property owners that they have nothing to worry uh, about given that there isn't an intelligent being behind it. If the law of entropy is absolute, as is the first law, why haven't I heard any discussion about the same within the paranormal circles. It wasn't until last year, after having picked up a copy of Pastor Mark Hunneman's book entitled Seeing Goes Through God's Eyes, that I have heard of any argument against the idea of residual hauntings that's understood within the paranormal community. Given what, and he mentions a certain demonologist, um, his views regarding territorial demons and Hunnaman's arguments, we at his group believe a number of residual haunts are demonic deceptions. Where Pastor Hunnaman and I part ways is that I do not believe every residual haunting is a show of the demonic deception. Given my experience in the field, it is my opinion that Hunnaman's argument does not take into consideration what we do not know about the spirit world, uh, or more specifically, its superior laws. These higher laws, which uh, we are as yet to become acquainted with very well, may possess the key to unlocking the mystery of residual hauntings. After all, the spirit world is a distinct creation and its higher laws are not constrained by our knowledge of the laws of nature. The physical only exists because of the spiritual in which the former is subjugated to the latter. A knowledge of the spirit realm is limited. To illustrate this difference, we need only to think of miracles. While miracles contradict nature, they are the outworkings of a higher law, a spiritual law. As the paranormal community at large postulates that residual hauntings are the product of released energy imprinting the environment, which is impossible according to the second law of thermodynamics, maybe we should adopt a better theory with a better explanation, the string theory. <laughs> And I have several things I would say to my friend. First, I would ask him, how would you distinguish between a demonically veiled, quote, residual haunt and those which are caused by higher spiritual laws intruding into nature? See, in the last segment, we saw the insuperable difficulties in determining between intelligent and non-intelligent haunts. The same would apply here. I would also ask them what percentage of are them are demonic and how would you determine? Have you with faith and fervor rebuked all the alleged natural seeming residual haunts to see what would happen? Um, I don't think that he's been able to explain how it can be done. 
Um, certainly the disciples never did it. Jesus never made a distinction or spoke of residual energy. I'd also say this, that miracles, that's not a very good analogy by my friend, because miracles don't occur due to some higher laws in the spiritual realm. Miracles occur because God himself performs activities which overrule his natural laws. It's not as if some higher spiritual laws are intruding into our dimensions to cause miracles. No, it is a very personal act of God himself who is intruding into his creation when we see miracles happen. There, um, <clears throat> there, are, there are higher spiritual beings in the Bible, angels and demons, but there's no evidence of a higher spiritual realm with higher spiritual laws which intrude regularly upon our world and in a very mysterious way. I think this notion really detracts from God's glory because instead of the activity coming directly from God, it is alleged to be the outworkings of some mysterious spiritual realm. You know, I'd be the first to admit that the universe is full of uh, mystery, but that's not the issue. I think, frankly, that my friend is so wed to his belief that um, uh, this is, has a sound of desperation to me, to be honest. For the laws of thermodynamics to be circumvented, it would, t it would take a direct action of God himself, a miracle. And miracles are to serve, and this is important, some holy purpose. We're coming upon the Resurrection Sunday or Easter, and the resurrection proved that Jesus is who he said he was. <laughs> and what holy purpose is served behind these looping phenomena that happen supposedly so regularly. What, what holy purpose is behind these um, kind of semi-miracles coming from the um, higher spiritual realm? You know, why would higher spiritual laws be employed to confuse people or even frighten them? So I have, I have a lot more experience in this field since uh, I wrote my book, about 100 cases, and um, I, I can confidently say that no haunting that I was involved in or infestation was residual in nature. And the ones which the clients themselves thought were residual due to watching TV turned out to be very demonic when rebuked in the name of Jesus. However, if someone is in, engaged in communication with the spirit realm, which my friend is, then they have so compromised their spiritual authority by grieving the Holy Spirit that rebuking uh, uh, or discerning simply may not work. Okay. His reasoning is uh, confusing because on the one hand, he's arguing for a purely supernatural explanation for residual energy. But then, at the very end, he switches gears and postulates string theory, which is a hypothetical um, theory in, in physics, but it has nothing to do with higher spiritual laws. So, we got two problems here. Is, you know, which is it? Is it a higher spiritual law or is it a law of physics? Um, my second problem is it was string theory itself because it's so beset with its own problems. <clears throat> um, it's, it is a purely hypothetical theory or model with no empirical evidence. Uh, to back it up. It looks good on paper if, 
from what I understand, you postulate the existence of 11 or more dimensions. So without going into more detail, the string theory is a pretty, what I call abstruse theory. It's just difficult, it's complex. And I've learned that when you introduce unnecessary abstruseness, complexity, and confusion, then something's wrong. You know, the notion of residual energy is already confusing enough, but to introduce a purely speculative model of physics to explain it, why would one law like string theory contradict, um, you know, a, another law of science which has been proven to be absolute across the board thermodynamics so my friend fails i believe in his attempt to defend uh, residual uh, energy and um, next i'll move on to uh, another friend of mine uh, named timothy yohe i hope i pronounced that correctly he uh, has written a, a unique and thought-provoking book entitled Limestone and Its Paranormal Properties. Now, before reading this book, Tim and I had been communicating regarding a shared passion in the connection between paranormal investigators acquiring serious sickness, which is obviously far from being a mere theoretical issue. It's intensely human and personal issue which calls for uh, compassion. Um, but we need to ask, though, why are so many investigators becoming sick? It's the deep, dark secret of the paranormal community. In a word, it is demonic oppression due to unlawful entry into the spirit realm. And sadly, this is exactly what is happening with my two friends. And in his book, Tim unwittingly gives proof of this. For, well, before I go on into that, let me say this, that Tim is the only person I know who has attempted to explain one of the most basic and underlying uh, uh, widely excuse me, accepted tenets of the paranormal community, the residual haunt, uh, as well as limestone, um, why what limestone seems to feed paranormal activity. And that's why I have immense respect for him. And um, his arguments, though, are, again, what I would call abstruse. They are so complex uh, even convoluted at times, um, that it uh, if you judge them by Occam's razor, which we've talked about before, that the simplest explanation is the that um, that can explain the phenomena is the one to be preferred. Well, the biblical model is much much more simple than what Tim proposes in his book. I really can't do his book justice, don't have the time. But let me fast forward to the end of his book in which Tim states that his home has always been very active. And I would ask him why, my friend. You see, the same, quote, little girl that his wife played with when young is now playing with their daughters. And that raises a red flag and a question how did this entity follow them and what is it I know what it is it's a demon Tim assumes it's a little girl but I know otherwise on page 121 he lists about a dozen paranormal phenomena which occur regularly in his home including apparitions and some pretty severe negative activity why is residual energy causing such personal attacks on my friend when it's supposedly, you know, non-intelligent? Okay, so one of the things that he mentions is that quartz is piezoelectric, uh, meaning that when pressure is added to it, it emits an electrical charge, and when subjected to AC current, it vibrates. 
Now, that's interesting, um, but it doesn't really give any um, foundation for how limestone of quartz could retain energy and uh, prevent it from diffusion into uh, equilibrium. He goes on to say that uh, quartz has deep spiritual significance. It is said to be able to heal, absorb negative energies, and then he quotes this saying, Crystals are living beings, incredibly old and wise, and willing to communicate when an individual is open and ready to receive. Page 73. Um, no, Tim. I, I quote that just to give you an idea of where he's coming from as far as um, his, his worldview and um, where it, he, he uh, just some of his assumptions. And he quotes from the poet Robinson Jeffers saying that granite can remember and display patience. He is personifying an inanimate object which is a fallacy, logical fallacy, and it is a pagan New Age ritual that uses crystals to heal. These rituals are a doorway to the demonic. Tim uses um, an air freshener analogy in a car to explain how energy can be stored in limestone and emit its influence. However, he overlooks the second and third laws of thermodynamics in his discussion. He mentions them, but very briefly and without um, much sensitivity at all as far as extending them to their logical conclusion. If you can use an air freshener analogy, it would be more apt to say that this air freshener is in a convertible moving at fast speed. That's what energy does uh, as far as diffusion into equilibrium is very fast. It's not just going to be emitted very slow into the environment and stay at a place for hundreds of years, as he states in his book, happens. Nowhere does he interact with how limestone can overcome the absoluteness of the laws of thermodynamics. In a word, his theories are not verifiable. And to make matters worse, some of the alleged worst residual haunts in the world are not made of limestone. I don't, like I said, I don't have time to do the book justice. But suffice it to say that Tim has tried to find in limestone the missing mechanism for residual energy, but he fails in that regard, and he fails to show how or why limestone can overcome the absolute laws of thermodynamics. Thus, the notion of residual energy and haunts fails in so many regards. My dear friends, as we bring this series to a conclusion, this popular notion needs to be rejected, at least re-examined seriously. And folks need to bow before the creator of energy, the Lord Jesus Christ, who through the infinite display of divine energy and power was raised from the dead. Amen.